Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. Hey. Hello. How you doing? I'm good. Yeah? Yes. You ready for today? I think so. I want to read you something. Yeah. Uh, something we've been talking about a little bit and I think would be interesting to our audience. It's something I find interesting and I want to talk about it, the two of us, from our different perspectives. Something you wrote? No. This is... Uh, an article from somewhere called Very Well Mind. Very Well Mind, okay. And here's where it starts. I'm just going to read you a short excerpt, and then I want to talk about it. It starts with, we all wear masks. Every day we enter into situations that require us to hide certain parts of ourselves, our pain, our anxiety, or our self-doubt. Many of us are asked to code switch or adapt to the common denominator. It's a reality of civilized life that is pretty tricky to escape. But for neurodivergent people, the phenomenon of wearing a mask is more than just a periodic situational adaptation. It can feel like a survival tactic that's almost constantly necessary. So I want to talk about this idea of masking. And I want to talk about specifically what it is, why we do it, and then also how increasing your self-awareness could maybe help you cope uh, in different ways and also be aware of when you're masking and maybe when you're not and things like that. That's my broad base for today. Yikes. That's kind of uncomfortable. Oh, is it? A little. Oh, okay. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's, I'm perfectly happy to talk about it, but it's, I'm not trying to make, you know, masking is like, First of all, masking is like pretty new to me as a con as a word. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I've been masking like my whole life because with for much of which I didn't know it was even a thing. Right. I, just, I just thought it was like something everybody had to do at the level that I was doing it. Um, I think it is something that all humans have to do. So, so if you think about it, like a a Venn diagram, all humans have to mask some part of themselves, right? Yeah. Because just to deal with society, you you have to like not yeah. be the full blown monkey that you are. Yeah. <laughs> and then the more rigid society gets, the more you have to mask, right? Because right. you're you know limited to. So I think it's something that all people can understand, you know. Um, it's like you're sitting at this like fine restaurant, right? And it's all hoity-toity and stuff, and you just mm -hmm. want to pick up the meat and eat it with your hand. Like turkey leg, like a monkey. Yeah, exactly. Like I think all of us have that in us. So that's yeah. a form of masking, right? Like yeah. in, a, in, a, in the Venn diagram that is all humans. Yeah. That's a, We're all doing stuff like that. When we go to work, we don't, you know, cry and... We carry on. To. We try not to, you know, and that's yeah. a form of masking. So, yeah. I mean, I think everybody knows what masking is. The The question is, are there certain populations that because they're out of alignment or out of sync with the norm, yeah, that they just have to do a lot more of it, right? And for yeah. neurodivergent people in a neurotypical society, a normal, nor, normal, neuronormal society, yeah. Yeah, you know, it just means that you have to do a lot more of it. And oftentimes you don't even know what you're supposed to be masking. And what I mean, that's the hardest part is like not knowing what, because if you think about it, the, the metaphor is a mask. Like, so, you, yeah. So say you have this mask and it's like half your face. One of those, like uh, one of Phantom the, of the Opera. Phantom of the Opera mask, yeah, yeah. right? And you're like, well, which part of my face do I, am I supposed to cover up? Right. right. Is it is it the, is it this side that's that's offensive or is it because yeah, yeah. to me they're both they both look the same. So, right. you know, you don't even know which part of your face you're needing to cover up and you're not even sure what the mask is supposed to look like. Yeah. <laughs> right? so, yeah. so you're not even sure what to cover it up with. So you're like, oh, I'll use this. Uh, well, I, know, yeah, I think turkey it, feather. <laughs> And then you're like, peacock is this it? Feather. Or whatever. Peacock and, feather. And people are like, what is that? Yeah. Well, I guess the thing that's interesting to me is is the distinction of it seems like for non-neurodivergent, for neurotypical people, it's a situational choice that 
even though it's masking, comes fairly easily and is a, is a conscious choice out of necessity that you understand, right? But for neurodivergent people, it sounds like masking actually becomes, um, like they said, a survival tactic that's co constant. And what you were just saying is it, it's not always clear how to mask or what to mask, but that you know you need to be masking constantly because there's this mismatch, right? between how you exist and how people, neurotypical people could perceive you, I guess. Yeah, for sure. But I don't know, I just- But it's sort of, um, it's, I mean, this might be a, a, a literal case of me masking so much that I even mask when I'm talking yeah. about masking, but yeah. I just have this sort of deep need not to not, to not include everybody, you know? And- not to not include. So yeah, to, to include, include yeah, right? Double negative. <laughs> it's like we don't want to use masking as a way to say we're different and you're the other. No. Right? Like you neurotypical people, you don't understand, you know, blah, blah, blah. We're right. you, like, I think every human understands what it's like to have to hide a part of yourself in a given situation. Yes. What we're talking about is really the quality and the quantity of the masking that has to take place, right? Right, and and uh, and the confusion, the the utter confusion that people have around what what are the rules, right? You know, like so many social rules are so they seem so logical to people to mm -hmm. to like what I perceive as n n neuro normal typical people, mm -hmm. but. They're just very confusing to people that are that are not part of that club. You right. know, they're just like I I don't understand a bunch of them. I mean, and as you get older, you learn to understand them. You know, yeah. but it takes a long time because they're just totally in in opposition to your set of logics. Okay, so how so how do you learn? You just said you learn about them over time. So you're saying as you get older, you start to recognize them in yourself or? Well, some of us do. I mean, some of us just continue banging our head against yeah. the neurotypical society wall and, and yeah. like bleeding. And, and But once you build enough scar tissue on your head and, and you bleed enough, you go, ah, this isn't fun. Let's try, let's try learning. <laughs> and let's try to figure out what's gonna please the and again, like, I don't want to say neurotypical people because it's like more a neurotypical society because neurotypical people are wonderful. You're neurotypical. And I, I love you. I and, you know, and you you have made my life immeasurably better. And you have made mine immeasurably better. Right. So yeah. it's more it's more like the edifice, the sociological edifice of of the norm. Why do you just call it the norm? Yeah. Or the social norm. Yeah. It's like you have to you have to go up against the social norm. That is a lot illogical to you right but is logical to the norm because they're part of the norm right i mean it's yeah. it's not so different from the the metaphor that you've used before which is like yeah school we all just want to the headmaster says i want to make everything equitable and fair so we're going to ask everybody to climb the same tree and it's a bunch of monkeys and a fish i'm a monkey and so the <laughs> you know the monkeys are like great that sounds right that sounds great that's mm -hmm. fair everybody gets in the and the fish is like tree you know like <laughs> air <laughs> what and then the fish is left behind yeah the fish is literally suffocating as you're telling him how that's equitable terrible. this environment is he's like i can't breathe that's terrible <laughs> right. i mean it's appropriate to them i mean the metaphor is appropriate but yeah. it's really really sad it's a little it's a little sad no it's and then you're sad. like come on fish what's climb. wrong with you climb fish, come on, climb. <laughs> <laughs> there must be something wrong with you. And you're like, I don't know. And then and then later in that fish's life, by some hook or crick, this fish learns to like suck out of enough puddles to survive. <laughs> and later the fish finds like, oh, there's this thing called the ocean. Mm -hmm. And people live there and there's other fish like me. And that's like a big that's a big moment for that fish where they're like, there's a whole place where all the air is water. Yeah. That's cool cuz I'm used to, I'm really good at breathing water and like moving in water. Yeah. And all the monkeys are like this is hard. I Talk can't breathe, yeah. you know, and and uh 
I don't I don't know how to deal with water and you know in a weird sort of way society has become a lot more like water which is why we have such a huge incidence of I think people that are feeling more neurodivergent legitimately so I mean they might not have a diagnosis of some neurodivergence but they are feeling legitimately like they're neurodivergent because society is becoming more like water in its fast pace and chaos and yeah you know and that's something that that fast paced chaos with signal coming from everywhere and never knowing what's up and what's that that that's that is the neurodivergent mind so we're just like oh no yeah. i'm comfortable in this so when you say in what chaos so you're saying what it feels like to be neurodivergent and you're making the analogy to the overwhelm of information coming in for people all people totally. say more about what you how you would characterize the feeling the feelings that you're well think about to. it like we went we took the family bowling the other day right yes, and did. at the end of bowling i was like i was like this yeah. you know because bowling is a very interesting i love bowling and it's fun but a bowling alley is a lot of people making a lot of noise first yeah. of all just regular people noise mm -hmm. but then there's all the pins at all random different times and you hear every single one of those pins yeah. going down yeah. <laughs> You know, and and then the ball, boom. Yeah. And especially when people are like hucking the ball and, on kids the ground, little it. kids are like <laughs> dropping it on the ground, and it's like, Dush. yeah. And then the hitting of the ball to the pins, and then the the swiper thing, and the ball and the return. gully, and the ball return, and, and it's just a lot of stimulus, a lot of very interesting sounds. And if you have kind of misophonia or soundy kind of issues, then. It's a lot of sounds. Well, and there's also right? a lot of light. It's a lot of light, and then yeah. our son is whistling and constantly. <laughs> and so we love our son. Like, yeah, they had like a disco ball, <laughs> and like it's just a lot of stimulus, right? Yeah. And if you have a brain that isn't filtering any of that stimulus, and is and is actually exacerbating some of that stimulus in cases of misophonia or something like that. Yeah. Meaning you're hearing sounds differentially, or you're, you're yeah. seeing light differentially than than the norm. By the end of that experience, you feel like frazzled. you're you're like a frazzled cat, right? Yeah. And um, and I think so. Take that metaphor of a normal environment that normal people don't really have an issue with. Well, I think the work environment of today, the political environment of today, the social environment of today, for a lot of neuro normal or neurotypical people is starting to feel like that i think that's true. it's like there's umpteen different messages and even though they have executive function even though they have filters there's so much coming in that even their filters are being overwhelmed and so you're getting a huge number of people who are not yeah you know they're not diagnosably neurodivergent but they're feeling neurodivergent and, right. and and I I honor that I I think I think yeah. we should be like yeah this is come on in it's a big tent <laughs> well yeah I mean there's a couple of things that I would say about that let me see if I can do it so the first thing is the bowling alley analogy it's it, it's it's frazzling for me but it's frazzling for me in the context of I can focus on the parts of it that I need to focus on but eventually over time it's like it's seeping in. Uh, in ambient right, right. noise, right? But like I have the ability to just focus on the pins or focus on the light or focus. Eventually, over time, it starts to be overwhelming. There's a lot of information in the, I mean, yeah. a lot of, I mean, the sources of information have just multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. Yeah. The also, sources of perspective have multiplied. You, yeah. We're getting just more signal everywhere. Oh, yeah. And the other thing I know I was going to say, uh, and also there's a norm that's happened over our lifetime in the last two decades, and it's been going up, which is you are expected to handle more and more and more, more and, and more. more and take more and more yeah. in with no corollary space, yes. you know, along with it. So it's like we, we are expected to be on our phone and available by email or by phone 24 hours a day now right. that we have cell phones. Right. Well, when we were young... You walk down the street, nobody could call you. Totally. You were present in that moment. You're walking totally. down the street and you could hear the birds and the trees and you don't hear the trees, you see the trees, right? But now we're at this place where 
the not only are we all experiencing the same pain, but it's also becoming normative that we're all suffering totally. that way. Yeah, I mean, it, in a way, you could say that society has become much more almost interdisciplinary mm -hmm. in its expectations of people, and jobs have become more interdisciplinary yeah. in their expectations of people. So now it's totally normal to be like, oh, yeah, you need to handle... 20 more things than you used to handle in your job and there's less resources to do it with yes and if you take for example i mean it's always dangerous to make sweeping generalizations in these ways but you know take take women women used to be you know you know this they I do. used to be more in the household taking care of those kinds of things well then women's lib all that stuff well, you didn't get like, oh, let's exchange these duties for these ones. You got, oh, let's do all those. And you get to have all these too. Yeah. Right. So it's not like you got less. No. Or different. No. You just got more. Well, there's. And less time. Yes. And there's a book on it called The Second Shift, which was written in <laughs> exactly. the 70s or 80s, which is literally, you didn't just, you didn't gain you didn't get more space. You actually now have two jobs. Yes. You have exactly. the job that's your job, right. and then you have all the other stuff that's called the second shift that you do from 6 p.m. till midnight. And again, that's not always the reality, no, but but I mean, it is, you can notice that for sure yeah, for, for sure. a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. And and so if that's what you're experiencing, then that's going to make you feel a lot of these, mm -hmm. these kind of what neurodivergent people are used to feeling all the time. Yes. A lot of the solutions end up being very similar, ironically, right. which means in a kind of a strange twist of fate, neurodivergent people have the answers to a bunch of things that we need that neurotypical people need yeah. to deal with a, a society that's going completely berserker. Right. But I guess for me, <laughs> I think it's it's interesting to think about what we can offer to each other. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if I understand you and the places <clears throat> where you need things, then I can leverage my neurotypicality yes. to focus or do this or do that or structure stuff a certain way. Yes. Which facilitates you being who you are in this space we call society. Absolutely. And then you also can push me and help me with the things that I'm dealing with that are similar to what you feel. 100%. So it's it's nice that there's this common there's now a place for a common conversation, right? Not just a common conversation, but a, a common imp a, a bigger impact, right? I mean, what we're seeing is that when we get true neurodiversity on teams, which includes, that doesn't mean create a team that is entirely neurodiverse. Right. It means create diversity across the team, mm -hmm. which means you have neurotypical, you have neurodiverse of all different kinds. You have di true diversity of thought and thought style and kind of brain chemistry on the team, yeah. you actually have much more innovation, much more impact, all kinds of things. And that's because of the diversity. And by the way, if we think that's new, it's not. That's as old as evolution. The, the, the benefits of, of diversity? Yeah, like the goal of evolution is biodiversity. That's right. In many ways, you could have Darwin named his book "Origin of Species." He was talking about the the origin, how a how a group, mm -hmm. a species of organisms, originates. Yeah. Right. So he was talking about the or he wasn't talking about the the beginning of life. He was talking about how a group, a, a species of things, originates in the tree of life. Right. Right. He could have equally called that on biodiversity. Yes. Right? He yes. could have said, how does how do things get so diverse? Right. And nature is is bringing about diversity because diversity is more stable. Well, it creates resilience. It creates systems, resilience right? in systems, absolutely. Yeah. So we so we want diversity. Like it it seems crazy to me that people are like, "Oh my god, diversity works." You're like, "Yeah, diversity <laughs> works. Re real, genuine, authentic diversity." especially diversity of thought and you know brain chemistry yeah. and like approach and you know not not superficial diversity but real diversity like people that are really actually different they're coming from totally different angles yeah that kind of diversity is going to always lead to better stuff 
Yeah. That's what's remarkable about the United States and being a melting pot is that we have this tremendous, rich diversity and somehow we find a way to have it be a, a melting pot of, of remarkable diversity. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting. I mean, I think also when we talk a lot with, you know, p different people we work with around diversity, there have been a there have been there's been a, a bit of a shift I've seen when we're talking to, I don't know, corporate execs who who have noticed that there is a need for that intellectual diversity. Yes. I don't know if you want to call it like thought style, nerd, you know, like actual neurodiversity. Yes. And I can't remember where it was. I read something about, oh my gosh, the more that that forty per, I think it was forty percent of neurodiverse people are unemployed. But when you have teams that are neurodiverse, like made up of people who are neurotypical and neurodiverse, you increase your production by like 30%. Right. I mean, so think about those two numbers together. That's right. I mean, that's... And that 40%, I think a lot of people think, they don't think about the dynamics of that 40%. They think 40% of neurodiversity ND people are unemployed. That number, I think a lot of people will reflect on the people, the neurodiversity yes. people, but that number should reflect on the interaction between those people and the environment. Yes. Right? We are not creating environments that are friendly to these folks. And mm -hmm. believe me, I know, like I'm in academia, it's like not a friendly place, <laughs> uh, you know, for neurodiverse people. And, uh, it, and very few places are very friendly to neurodiverse people. Yeah, I do um, think that's that's why masking slowly. is so so critically important. Yes. And there's so many different kinds of masking that we do just to like fit in, just, just to, to be not, able to sit at a table and have just to sit at a table and just to like not piss everybody off. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's hard to even talk about this stuff because you know, in order to talk about it, it sounds like you're ripping on other people. But g generally speaking, like people are sensitive. Yes. You know, and neurodiverse people sometimes Lack there's not a filter. huge filter between like what's going on up here and this. And you don't really uh, it's not it's not everything's personal. Like there's just sort of factual things that just seem incredibly factual and they're not personal. And there's there's no way that you could imagine them being taken personally. And yet somehow they're taken personally. Yeah, I mean, I think one way to think about it is... So there's a lot of landmines in, a, yeah, in yeah. every meeting if you can't say, like, the sky is blue, and people are like, I can't believe you said that. And that's, that's what we experience. We're like, yeah, yeah. Oh, I said that the sky was blue. Yeah, but part of that is that because neurodiverse... Not, you know, I'm not neurodiverse, but I can speak to sort of what I know um, experientially. Being, You're definitely not. No, I know. You took the... the I, uh, I'm... The all poster the, child for neurotypical. All the tests and you got like the lowest <laughs> scores I've ever seen. Right. <laughs> it's but, <funny>. oh. <laughs> well, it gave you a nice contrast for I your know, story. it's awesome. I think what's interesting is what a lot of people may not realize is that an, a lot of different types of neurodiversity and not neurodiverse people, mm -hmm. they literally are taking a lot in, but they're also um, very observant and perceptive and also kind of literal. In, in the interpretation of reality. Literality is, a, yeah. is definitely one of them. So if a neurodiverse person says to you, I don't like that tie. Yeah. Not that anybody said that, but I'm just using an example. It's literally that maybe there's black and white stripes that are bothering yeah. your eyes. And yeah. you just literally are just saying, I don't like that tie. Yeah. It's not you suck because you bought that tie. Yeah, no. It's, it's like, it's... I just, I actually don't like that tie. Yeah, that tie is ugly. No, not the tie is ugly. I don't like that tie, which is totally Or not that personal. tie is ugly. Well, okay, so it could be that tie is ugly because that's also not personal. But I'm just saying, and you know. It's personal to the tie. Like the tie, if the tie got upset, I would understand that. Because you called it ugly. Because I just called it ugly. And you don't like it. And I don't like you, tie. Yeah, but the tie. I would understand that if the tie was like, wait a minute. <laughs> you can't say that. F you, I like myself. <laughs> <laughs> but... Like, you're not the tie. Yeah, I guess. So I don't know why you would get upset about that. Well, I think... I, th I don't know why you'd be wearing a tie in the first place. Well, that's a whole nother issue. I'm just kidding. That's a whole nother I issue. I like ties. Some people wear ties. Some ties are cool. 
I'm totally fine with ties. I'm not, that was just a joke. See, that's a, yeah. That's another example. Another filter problem. What if all of us just eased our filters up a little bit? Would we actually be more honest with each other? Yeah, that would like, be cool. Would communication be far more meaningful? You know, if we weren't. Well, if we, I, I think, I think one of the things we could do is make make words a little less important and actions mm. far more important. Yeah. You know, like, cause, cause I can think crazy things. I can think that there's a squirrel riding a bicycle. Like that doesn't mean that there is an actual squirrel riding a bicycle. I just said those things. Yeah. We can think and say all kinds of things that aren't, aren't meaningful in any, in any practical or behavioral sense, actionary sense. Right. Yeah. Like they're and, not loaded with intention. Or- and when you're short on dopamine, a lot of times you say things just to like, just to, for the entertainment of saying things, like for the entertainment of imagining them, because yes. you, you have this rich imagination and you can imagine like this crazy thing or, the, or you know, or you just think things. Mm-hmm. You just think things and then you say them. Yeah. I will say, and I think this is probably one of the most misunderstood parts of, um, Maybe I shouldn't say most, but but for me, in my opinion, one of the most misunderstood parts of neurodivergence is that that we're somehow not interested in being social. Right. We don't. We're not great at big social things or social things per se. We don't know the rules. They don't make a lot of sense. That kind of stuff. But we actually desperately want a team. We desperately want connection Mm -hmm. we we want to be a part of things and we don't want to hurt people's feelings right you know by saying something like you know something that's something that to us feels like just a logical statement yeah but maybe to someone else feels like an insult or that you're being mean right and masking a lot of masking is is to avoid it's not masking isn't Masking, a lot of masking is us trying to avoid hurting or insulting or being perceived as mean to other people. So it's actually an act of like, hey, I don't actually want to have this effect. And if I'm having this effect, I will mask in order to stop having this effect because I really don't want to have this effect. Right. But yet everywhere we go, we have this effect. And well, we get fired and, you know, I mean, I've been fired friendships. from so many jobs. You can't imagine. Why? Because I'm not competent? No. no. I'm, one, one, I'm one of the more competent people. I'm very good at things. I'm very competent. Mm-hmm. But I keep getting fired from jobs. You know, why is that? Oh, because because uh, navigating the social thing. To what degree do you think your own... The work you've done to develop self-awareness has helped you navigate things a little bit better for yourself, knowing knowing the challenges that you've been facing over your life. Do you think that metacognition, self-awareness has been a key to you? For example, you know, you now exist in a world successfully that I think in without time. metacognition, I mean you said to what degree? Yeah. To the most degree, to 100% degree, like, I can nearly assure you that if I didn't find metacognition and DSRP, I would be dead Hmm. or in jail. Interesting. Because of your inability to control your impulses or your... No, I'd probably be in jail for some weird, like, like misunderstanding, misunderstanding, you know, where I just was like, no, this isn't true. I'm being, you know, like, I, that wasn't what it was. And then they're like, nah, 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 and then all of a sudden some, you're like some, in jail somehow. Yeah. Some bad, some bad some, series of misunderstandings bad, and events. Yeah. Like, yeah. Not like hurting anyone. No, no, no. But no. like just some bad series of like not knowing yeah. how to I don't know. Like you butt up with a system. Some system. And you don't know how to deal with it. Not hurting another person. Butting up against some system. Hmm. And then and then the system just chewing you up. Yeah. That's how that's how it happens. 
The yeah. system chews you up. Because you don't know how to navigate the system because the system is not built for you. The system is it's, illogical. It's just not for me. Yeah, it doesn't work. It makes you're no the fish sense. trying I'm to the, climb a tree. Yeah. And you and and somehow along the way you Right. So like it. if I brought like a little bit of like a bowl of water where I could breathe into it up mm -hmm. the tree and they're like no water in this tree and you're like but I need it to live and they're like no you're cheating you're now you have to go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> fish jail. <laughs> you go to fish. No, you go to monkey jail. As a fish. As a fish. That's not good. And then you die. Yeah. Because you're in monkey jail and you're a fish. Exactly. That's terrible. All right. No so bowl of water for you. One thing I would really want you to talk to. Yeah. Is what advice would you give to people in terms of developing the kind of skill sets or awareness <clears throat> that have helped you? Like. What would you say to somebody who said, hey, I am you. I'm like a you. young person? Yeah, I'm you 10 years ago. I'm Well, you're older, so yeah. I'm you 20 years ago. <laughs> I'm you 100 years ago. <laughs> I'm you <laughs> BC. And I'm 50. No. Uh, you know, somebody who's, you know, trying to navigate it. Well, if, I mean, the, that, the, the when you're first starting out, the most easiest thing, the most important thing is just the distinction between difference and disability, yeah. right? I mean, you just have to see yourself regardless. I mean, regardless of what it is, you've got to see yourself as a unique fingerprint that is that has a place in this world and that can that can bring something good to this world. Yeah. So you got to see that. And that doesn't mean that it's not going to be challenging. It doesn't mean that it's not going to be difficult. It doesn't mean that there's, you, you know, you got dealt a hand which isn't, a, which isn't a, you know, straight flush. Yeah. But you're going to have to take your hand of one ace, a six, a five, a three, and, you know. A ten. A ten. <laughs> and you're going to have to live your life with that hand. You're going to have yeah. to turn that hand into a different hand and then utilize the hand the best you have with, you know, bluffing and all kinds of whatever. I'm just using a poker metaphor yeah. now. That's your hand and it's a unique hand and it's a, and there's a gift in that yeah. hand. And if you can find the gift in that hand, you can play that hand and win mm -hmm. for you for and your, find your for place. and find your place and help the world be a better place and contribute and because because you have this unique thing and um, this unique brain and it works weird and different and it's your job I say this all the time um, you know you're like this monkey mm -hmm. and you're in, now we're mixing metaphors because you're no longer a fish but you're this monkey mm -hmm. and this primate, and um, and you're also Jane Goodall. Yes, we've talked about this. And you're both. Yeah. You have to be the monkey, and you got to be Jane Goodall, and you've got to become this incredibly wonderful observer yeah. of your monkey. Yeah. And learn about that monkey and understand that monkey, and if you do that, you will gain self awareness, mm -hmm. and everything else comes from that. Yes. Everything else comes from that. Yes. And you will find new ways to engage with social situations without having to mask as much. Right. From self-awareness. You will you will find new ways of having deep and loving relationships without having to mask as much. Yes. Right? You will find a way to have a steady job mm -hmm. without having to feel like you're in a cage. Well, and to see a contribution that you're making. Yeah, you yeah. will be able to. You will be able to find your unique way of contributing and be seen, yeah. with without being you know ignored. Mm -hmm. So, it all starts with that. Yeah. That if if you see it as a disability, a non-ability. Yeah. You're just looking at the glasses half empty. Right. If you see it as a difference, then I think you're looking at the glass as both as as just a glass that has water in it yeah. and also doesn't have water in it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. And that's great. 
Well, and I think a lot of it is um, taking what what your perceived weaknesses or differences and turning them into your gifts, your strengths, your unique contribution. Yeah. You know, and seeing seeing the value that you can add. Yeah. In whatever situation. So I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing is, and I'm sure, like you know, I don't know. This is my own. Yeah. My own path is different from everybody else's path. So I don't know, you know, I, mm -hmm. you take whatever path you want to take. But but it's an important idea to understand that nobody's coming. I don't know. <laughs> it's a little harsh. But I know it's harsh, but nobody's coming. Yeah. And and if if you take the if you take the approach that nobody's coming and somebody comes then that's just a bonus, right? If you take the approach that I'm going to rescue myself mm -hmm. out of this terrible situation in the mountains yeah, and a helicopter shows up, that's not going to screw yeah. things up for you. That's going to be like, oh, great. I was on my way out and now I can jump in this helicopter and go. Yeah, yeah. But if you take the idea that I'm just going to stay here until a helicopter comes. You're it, just going to sit still. You might. And maybe not. You might just sit there for a long time yeah. and... and you know, freeze to death or something. So right. I, I just think that um, you've got to. So to me, that's along the lines of what I call BYOC. It's like BYOB, but it's BYOC. Meaning? BYOC yeah. is be your own coach. Yes, I like that. Be your own coach. And that doesn't mean don't look for coaches and mentors and all that. But if nobody's coming... That's not a reason not to be your own coach. Yeah. And and that relates to the to the idea of being Jane Goodall is like if you're a student of your own monkeydom, then you're gonna be a great coach to yourself and you're gonna figure out ways, you're gonna figure out many, many little productivity life hacks. Mm -hmm. And I mean I've been collecting life hacks. They didn't call them life hacks till recently, but I've been collecting what I call models. Yeah. Little models yeah. that I use for everything for my whole life. I know. I love models mm -hmm. because the models help me be productive. I mean, I got models for my email. I got models for my toothbrush. Toothbrushing. I've got models yeah. for. I got models for everything because I can't function without the little model that helps me understand it. Mm -hmm. So, be your own coach just kind of means like come up with your own models. Yeah. That you need that are designed just for you, just perfectly for you. Because that one at the store doesn't work. Right. So whatever, what works is what, what works. What works is what works. Yeah. And so you build your models. And that's why I created DSRP in many ways was to understand how to create models. And DSRP is like a model engine. You can just create as many models in whatever way you want to make them that are custom fit to you. And you can change them and evolve them on the fly. Mm-hmm. And you can make a model that serves you now in this moment for this thing. Yeah. Helps and then you navigate something. Helps you navigate that. And then, you know, some of the models you'll keep. Some of the models are one time use, some of them you'll keep for years. Yeah. I think those are the main things difference, not disability. Yeah. <clears throat> be the Jane Goodall to your own monkey. Yeah. And be your own coach. Yeah. You know, nobody's coming. And again, that doesn't mean that there aren't people out there that can help you and right. that will help you. There's wonderful people out there, mentors and all kinds of other things. But don't count on that. Count on you. you. Yeah. And and if you help yourself, usually there's going to be people around to help you. But if but if you if you're just waiting for somebody to help you, it might that's be rough. Wall. Yeah, it might be a while. Yeah, and I also think I think I'm saying that from experience, not from like I know. judging. I'm saying <laughs> I, I've waited a long time for somebody to help, and you know, like they often don't. It's not because they don't. It's not because people are mean or whatever. You know, they just don't exactly. They are not in your situation, so yes. they don't know. What to do? They don't even they sometimes. They don't even realize you need help. They don't even help. realize you need help. Right. And even if they did, they wouldn't know how to help you because your situation is unique. Yeah, but in a in a nice way, your three things all tie together, and the be your own coach is a way to facilitate you seeing your differences, 
not as a disability, but as a difference and a, maybe a unique strength or contribution, mm -hmm. you know, and also allows you to be self-reliant, but also learn how to be other reliant. Yes. Right. In, in different types of situations. So I think in a nice way, the, the BYOC sort of encapsulates all of it. So yeah, and like a, a simple example, just to make it practical, a simple example of that is like, for for example, if you're ADHD, I'm ADHD, and you know we have high, we have attentional uh, lack of agency and attentional things, right? Mm -hmm. Which means we don't always have the choice, the agency of what we're paying attention to, but we're really actually very good at hyper attention or hypo, not enough attention. We do both of those things quite well. Yeah. Well, so so if you learn what what leads to hyper attention, hyper focus. Yeah. And you learn which things are very difficult to focus on, you can actually utilize your hyper focusing abilities to to find a way to become hyper focused on the things that you're not very good at focusing on. Oh, I like that. You might not be good at attending to this thing. Right. Right. To brushing your teeth, let's say. Right. But you're really good at hyper focusing on something. You're really good at making one thing a the thing for a long time. Right. Like DSRP, you know, right. like I've made searching, you know, doing the science of DSRP. That was my singular focus for a long time. Right. Mm -hmm. I can use some of those skills to build the system that I need to be focused on tooth brushing. Right, which is a system that you need in place yeah, for yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I you're like taking your strength and using it to kind of like overcome a weakness. Yes, yes. You're leveraging that which is unique about yourself to deal with something but, that you need to deal with. But that's not going to happen if you don't Jane Goodall your monkey. Right. You got to understand the monkey that is this monkey mind that is yeah. you. You got to understand it. And that means awareness. Yeah. You got to Jane good all that shit. I was just thinking that we should make a T-shirt about Jane, Jane good all your shit. monkey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't know. She's a hero. She is a hero. She's her. amazing. I watched her. We watched her I one know. time sign books at a convention, and she was not young. No, I mean, and that was she, like ten know, years ago. I don't ago, know how old she was, ago. but she was like getting up there in age. Mm -hmm. And there were thousands of people, and they wanted their books signed. And we walked down, and there was a line out the building. I remember. Remember this? I did. And we went to dinner. We went dancing. We did all it all. Like, came back in at 1230 at night. Oh, I think it and was. And there was, there was still probably a line of, like, 50 people. Yeah. And I said, what is going on? She's up at the front signing books. And I said to her manager, what is going on? And she said, she won't leave until she signs every single person. You remember it was a... Um I remember, and it struck us because it was a book she wrote for children. Yeah. And so we got at the back of the line. Yeah. And we have the copy that was signed for our kids. She's amazing. Yeah. She was, uh, yeah. She is. She's an amazing person. Yeah. All right, my love. Yeah. I think it might be time to wrap. Is that it? Wow, that was so short. It wasn't actually. Well, was I don't know. Was like five Maybe minutes. your neurodivergent brain felt it. We don't have sometimes yeah. a sense of time, so that felt like five minutes. It didn't feel... Mostly probably because it was intimidating. It was? I'm sorry. I no, didn't you don't have to be sorry. To I, I, I don't have to See, be like that. Just, that's a good example of it. Yeah. Something that's intimidating just is. Yes, but as a neurotypical person, this is going to be fun on film. Yeah. I, I, It's not my intention for you to feel intimidated or uncomfortable. Right. I don't want you to feel intimidated, which is me putting my perspective on you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's a great example. Like, you're like, you're sorry. Why would you be sorry that I'm intimidated? Like, that makes no sense to me. Right. But to me, it makes total sense. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, that's the point is yeah. like, it takes all kinds. Yeah, yeah. But if you're just aware that to, to some people, it's when i hear you're sorry that i'm intimidated i i'm like huh what yeah. why, why? Yeah. and then i'm like why well, I, I just don't even know what to say well like i just i'm but you I'm just like, said it yeah i just that's what well, i just He's made kind of... a bunch of noises well what you also <laughs> said no but you were you at the very yes but you also said oh i don't know why you're sorry which is an interesting thing yeah so that's what i'm saying is those kinds of conversations can happen all over the place where right. where you you say that and i say oh well, to me, 
I don't want to make you, I don't want to feel like I've made you into, I don't want you to be intimidated. Yeah, yeah. But to you, it's just, you are intimidated, right? So it's it's just talking through the difference, I guess, is what I think. So. It's unsafe. Well, it's unsafe. It's, it's not, yeah, like, I don't know if it's intimidated per se. It's just, it's an unsafe place to talk about. Yes. Something that you're masking for good reason. Like when you talk about things that you've spent your life masking, there's a reason you've been masking them. I see. It's because most of the time it doesn't end well. Yes. It's like I'm poking a hole through your mask. Yeah. It just yeah. doesn't end well when you share with people what you really think and yeah. what you really feel and, and like, or that you don't feel something that they think you should feel. Yes. Or that you don't think something that they think you should think or yes. whatever. Yes. Or that you don't think at all like them. You think very differently than them. Yes. But I think we should be working towards a space where I can be NT and you can be ND and we can still speak to each exactly. other in a way that is honoring both of us. Not only that, I think, I think NT and ND people can heal each other. Absolutely. You know, like we have the secret sauce of, of each, each other's other. like kryptonite. Yeah. You know, because we're cool. You are? ND people are cool. Yes, you are. We're creative. We're like, we're like wild and crazy and do, we do great things you know and and like we're fun we're yeah. really fun yeah lots of random bike rides like neurotypical people are not fun. comforting <laughs> when they want to be and like grounding and and like they can get from point a to point b without efficiently, efficiently and you know like get shit done and uh, all right well okay so with that we're gonna wrap like, subscribe, comment. We love to hear what you think. And until next time, we'll see you again. Bye-bye.